Hello and welcome to ZTN for this special broadcast in partnership with Hevos and UNICEF. I am Samantha Rosari. Now, if you'd like to participate in this conversation, please don't hesitate and uh, do go to our Facebook page, and Papers TV Network, or our Twitter page at ZTN News. Now, one of the UNICEF 2020-2030 nutrition strategy agenda is to protect and promote diets, services, and practices that support optimal nutrition, growth, and development for all children, adolescents, and women. In 2016, more than 1.9 billion adults aged 18 years and older were overweight. Of these, over 650 million adults were obese. The trend towards an unhealthy diet rich in saturated fat, sugar and salt and poor in fruit and vegetables means that people in Africa are not just overweight but malnutritioned because they are receiving more than enough calories but not enough necessary nutrients to grow into healthy adults. Now, Hevo's Southern Africa, in partnership with UNICEF, launched the Youth Food Action Project on the 5th of August 2021 with the aim of improving the food environment by increasing availability and accessibility of healthy foods to school-aged children and adolescents in urban areas of Harare and Blawayo. As part of the strategy, they developed a food uh, change labs in each city to develop urban youth food champions. Now, today we have the participants on there, and uh, they're going to be telling us on their experiences in the lab and to also help us understand what influences youth food choices to raise awareness about some of the challenges the youth are facing uh, around the food environment and how we can advocate to create healthy, conscious communities. Now, he was launched a project in response to such a rising health issues under the theme, What Influences Diet Among the Urban Youth? Now, in studio, we are joined by a panel. As you can see, we have Shalin Chisho, who is a healthy eating and living activist, as well as a business owner. It's good to have you, Shalin. Thank you so much. All right. We also have Munyara Zimrapa, who is a research and development at Vita Grow Urban Farms. Munyara Zi, it's good to have you on this panel as well. All right, we also have my namesake, Samantha Sibanda. She is a human rights advocate. Samantha, it's good to have you on the show. Thank you so much for having me. And you. thank you. We also have Zororo Taruvinga, Zoronim Goti, CEO and founder. It's good to have you. Thank you very much. All right, uh, thank you very much for coming through. Now, I'll start with you, Charlene. In your view, what is it that is influencing diet among urban youth? Okay, <clears throat> excuse me. <laughs> thanks so much, Samantha. And also just want to say firstly, thanks to Hivos and UNICEF for allowing us to be a part of this great opportunity. Um, as we know that urban areas are, <clears throat> excuse me, <laughs> um, urban areas are featured for the greater um, socioeconomic development in comparison to rural areas, but they also concentrate, concentrate um, poverty and that influences um, what youths are eating today. So in some inst instances you find that um, healthy food is quite expensive and so this affects youth that come from low income households. Uh, we also look at the food environment. So for example, you have areas with low income urban areas where um, there are less supermarkets and these supermarkets now produce, um, they produce poor quality foods. There's less variety in what's readily available to them as well. And so you find that, you know, now there's less variety in the fresh produce, also the healthy foods that are readily available to the people. That's your fresh fruit and vegetables. Um, also just knowledge, you know, sometimes the youth don't know much about you know how to eat healthier for you know for specific to have a healthy diet or to prevent certain diseases you know and so they go according to you know what they know so if they don't have that knowledge then they just you know eat whatever um, sometimes they eat based on what tastes good to them mm -hmm. so they go with that you know if it tastes good then that's what they opting build opt to eat um, also the marketing and communication that influences what the youth are eating today so for example if you look at um, like junk food or fast foods I mean 
the advertising or communication is really bright colors. You've got your, you know, catchy jingles, your catchy taglines. The packaging is really lovely, and that's, you know, so they're more inclined to go for those foods in comparison to maybe healthy foods um, where, you know, it's a little bit dull, it's not really catchy, the packaging isn't really great. So, you know, they're not, they'll tend not to go for that. So they go for things that look appealing and appetizing as well. Um, I think, yeah, that's it, yeah. <laughs> so the economy is contributing a lot yeah, to it is. Uh, what uh, the food choices that the youth are having. Yeah, totally. And also, there is a much being spoken about healthy foods exactly, in general. Exactly, yeah. Razi, I'll come to you. What are some of the implications that can be caused by having an unhealthy eating habits as we are now communicating to the youth the implications <laughs> of some of these foods that is being communicated to them more than the healthier foods? Thank you very much for that. Um, so, as you mentioned before, um, the statistics on obesity and overweightness and... But, honestly, the implications of eating unhealthy are a lot more than just what the scale will tell you. You know, um, for example, your immunity is one. You know, we've just come... Well, we're still in a pandemic. Um, your, your ability to fight diseases is largely determined by what you eat and what food that your body has to work with to actually fight that disease. So, someone who eats healthy, who knows what they eat, though, you'll find them falling sick a lot less than someone who just eats whatever or someone who doesn't have access to healthy food as well. And then another big thing and probably a very probably the most insidious one is the things that your diet does to your mental health as well. Your performance, your mental performance, you know we live in an information age where recalling information, presenting information pretty much judges your, pro your productivity as a person. So with your diet, you know, you'll be impacting how well your brain can do that. And especially with youths, the development of the brain itself will be affected by the type of nourishment that you give and type of food that you have access to. So it goes a lot further than just, you know, what the scale will tell you. Mm -hmm. All right, Samantha, I'll come to you. How are youth with disability, how have they been affected in terms of accessibility of healthy food? And what role can we play to ensure that vulnerable people can have access to healthy food? Yeah, thank you, Samantha. I'll address the first question you asked first. Um, so if we look at persons with disabilities, they are people like everybody else. So all these things that um, Charlene has been mentioning, they also affect lack of knowledge, poverty as well. You know, um, young people with disabilities have got no opportunity to go to work. So economically, they can't even have a choice to choose whatever they, they really need. We work in, uh, in Mbare, mm -hmm. uh, where we see that there is a, a very big market, but accessibility is also an issue. Mm -hmm. Imagine going to that kind of a market with a wheelchair. So even all those things, they also come into play because we know that the accessibility issues are different. And we know that Mbare uh, provides cheap food. Uh, everything, the fruits are fresh, they're from the market, the, the, you know, the farmers, they come there and it's really fresh. But then the accessibility becomes a challenge. Uh, talk of somebody who comes maybe from, from another area, they mm -hmm. need to use public transport it's also not accessible. The place itself is not accessible. So yeah, these are, are some of the things. And also they are persons with other conditions. I'll take for example, like um, hyperactivity disorders. You can't really, uh, you know, choose what you want. People with uh, cerebral palsy, for example, who can't chew properly. Mm -hmm. Some even that we have also realized that some of the parents, they don't even give their children choices. Ah, they choose for them, you know, that kind of autonomy to choose what is best for your body, for whatever you need, is not even there for some of the young people with disabilities. The support persons or caregivers, they actually make the choices for them. And so as organizations, I work for a disabled persons organization, and uh, I think that the organizations have got a very big role to play in terms of giving support raising awareness. We've just joined this food change lab. It was really great. Mm -hmm. There are things that I myself didn't know. And I'm also uh, trying to help people in the communities, uh, trying to give awareness. Some of the things I didn't even know. Mm -hmm. So it's a very big role that HIVOS he, he and UNICEF have also done mm -hmm. to train people. Uh, because sometimes we take it for granted and say, ah, that was zero, or they know. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I really think that 
awareness raising is very, very important. I'm actually uh, yeah. very uh, glad that you're speaking of awareness raising because that was where I was going to. I mean, we're talking of all these challenges that are there. What is it that maybe you think that the youth should be empowered with to be able to make better choices in terms of uh, their diets and the food that they, they consume? I'll give it that too, Zora. Thank you. <laughs> well, um, there's a prototype that I've been working on mm -hmm. um, which helps to simplify the back of the packaging um, of, yes. of packaging which that's very complicated yes, i complicated. don't know how to yeah. so yeah. we're trying to come up with something that will have maybe we color coded and to help you see how much of the proper fats you should have how much of um cholesterol you should be having everything that is put there because everything is very scientific down there and you actually don't know what's in there or mm -hmm. how much you should take per day mm -hmm. because you just take that bag of chips and then you just eat it maybe if chips are not that bad but mm -hmm. if you eat excess amount it's not good for you so that also helps with us even the knowledge you just go check it out okay best before and that's it you take it home so that will also help uh, to see how much fat is in there how many mm -hmm. how much salts are in there how much carbohydrates are there so we can be conscious some of these things we don't we rely mostly on the manufacturer and we don't put any effort uh, ourselves on our side to then uh, really study and think uh, for ourselves or make a choice so that I think would also help with that. Okay, mm -hmm. is there anything else? I mean uh, there are issues a lot uh, to do with the attitude even of the youth so what can be done? Uh, you go out uh, Samantha to the I'm sure in the field even you so mm -hmm. all of you actually mm -hmm. you're always in the field you're interacting with the youth what can be done to change the attitude because telling Munukutitasa at the back of it can be it's a good move mm -hmm. but how can we get them to actually shift their gear and uh, think and focus in the way that we're trying to get them to. You know, I think that there's uh, the, the, the issue of limited choices, mm -hmm. you know, it actually limits even what you choose, mm -hmm. you know. So I think that if we are raising more awareness, I think the awareness raising is very, very important. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a study that we were told when we were at uh, the Youth Change Lab, and it showed that even the choice of food, it's not that somebody doesn't even have money. Mm -hmm. Because there was a question that they were asked, could they, um, if you had the money and you had the resources, what would you buy? Mm -hmm. They still chose the same thing. So which means that there is limited knowledge amongst the people. So that awareness raising, I feel, is, is really the center of improving lives. And you know, people are just being told all the time what to do. As a young person, you know, it's kind of boring, Kuti. Mm. You don't even have your own choice. Yes. You are just being told what to do, what to do. It's not nice. So mm. if the ch choices are just there and somebody can pick, I mm. think it's really, it's, it's really helpful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'd also say um, how it's prepared. That is the biggest thing. If, if, if we can raise awareness or like teach people how to prepare healthy foods well, it's either it's yeah. boiled or it's eaten raw. I mean, you know, so if you had people, to, you know, different recipes, just teaching people how to consume these mm -hmm. products in different ways, you know, also empowering businesses, you know, teaching them how to make different products that are readily available, with, you know, with these healthy foods, I think that could also really make a big difference. Okay, and how are you also including, maybe you spoke with, uh, with regards to uh, uh, the dis disabled youths, uh, but we also have the youth who are staying with their parents. Yeah. Those are the ones who buy. Yeah. Those are the ones who have access to uh, some of these foods. Is there any inclusive inclusiveness of uh, the parents or guardians who are taking care of these youths to actually tell them that no you know how how is it inclusive how is this uh, compared inclusive of uh, parents as well oh, well <laughs> Maybe let me give it to the gentleman sure. um, well like you said uh, the parents are the ones who make a lot of the choices in terms of food for most of us until uh, until we leave the house yeah you know so if they're now also buying you food that's not healthy, then you're going to eat it and you're not going to question it much. So I think it also comes down to us also educating the parents mm -hmm. themselves and telling them that, okay, ABC might be expensive, but it affects your child in 
this way and it's beneficial for them in this way. And also, like Charlene was saying, um, it, it's also preparation as well. You know, uh, you can't just give a child boiled ma veggie. I, I, <laughs> you would know, rather eat KFC rather than that. Yeah, and, that's true. You know, so finding different ways to prepare the foods and uh, teaching the parents as well. You know, this is how you prepare this. This is how you can make this tasty as well. That could also um, have a huge positive impact in how the youth, um, what kind of diet choices they make. Mm -hmm. mm. Uh, Zoro, in your opinion, what can be done to reduce the risk of non-communicable diseases caused by unhealthy diets amongst the youth? Uh, from what we've been talking about, um, looking at the uh, limited choices that are there, I feel if there are choices where the fast food is, because that's where we go most of the time, I would rather also have an option that there is a store or there is a shop there that sells also readily made, delicious, lovely looking food that I could just actually buy with maybe a description of what's in there. Um, instead of, you know, when you want healthy foods, there are certain places you have to go. You know, if there's a restaurant that is close to a gym or something, you go mm -hmm. there. But when you're hungry, you go the opposite direction. So I feel all these things must be placed in that way. and. Mm -hmm. Uh, when you are looking into how people are getting sick and how we are not being active, mm -hmm. uh, we are not being active, we are not um, uh, interacting with others, we don't have maybe running clubs or we're driving everywhere mm -hmm. or maybe you're catching public transport, you don't have time to go exercise. Yes. Your days are very, very long mm -hmm. and we must then find a way to balance all that. And I feel also when it comes to kids, I would love for them to participate in packing their lunch boxes yeah. and in schools um, because now what's lovely now is uh, the curriculum is changing. It's mm -hmm. not like four subjects we used to do back then. They should introduce nutrition and make it fun, put more effort in it to say, okay, now we are talking about nutrition. A child knows that I must have five colors in my what, mm -hmm. on my plate. And uh, I feel that to actually excite them because that is the generation now we are going to be dealing with in the later days. Mm -hmm. So if they know that, uh, the way our parents or some of us are not educated, by the time they get uh, to our age, mm -hmm. they'll be better educated and they'll be healthier and happier. Mm -hmm. Just to make it exciting. Just to make it I, exciting. Exactly. I like how you're speaking about going to the grassroots level of going back to school, mm -hmm. my schools. These kids need to have it endorsed in them and, uh, you know, uh, hammered in them to yeah. say that, you know what, eating healthy is not as boring as it may, mm -hmm. as it is made to it's look. Like so, yeah, it's like punishment sometimes. Yeah, it's like punishment. Eat your veggies, exactly. <laughs> How do you make That's it exciting? <laughs> <laughs> All right, just still on that excitement path mm -hmm. and there is, the, uh, you know, the, the, the role of innovation and technology, Munyaradzi. How can we make sure that uh, young people have a healthy eating and uh, a healthy living and eat healthily using ICT somehow, it, especially when we go back as well to the grassroots levels, how can ICT help in um, talking about these uh, pertinent issues? Mm, well, like, um, like as been mentioned before, mm -hmm. a lot of the accessibility of, health, of healthy food to young people is determined by, well, firstly, the marketing of the stuff. Um, you know, unhealthy, you know, your chomkins and whatnot, they'll have shiny packaging mm -hmm. and look nice and appealing and then your mavidia just, you know, just browning on the side. Mm -hmm. So innovation and, and technology is very crucial in this because there is a balance between um, economic viability that you have to strike if you want to produce these healthy foods. But with innovation and with people who are willing to reinvent the wheel even, to find the balance between producing economically viable food, which is also healthy and also prevents these non-communicable diseases. That is possible. And um, the role of ICT in it is, um, is also in terms of the marketing of it as well, and finding ways and, and also um, various technologies in the actual production line as well. For example, precision agriculture is uh, one key area where ICT plays and can actually help produce um, cheaper, more affordable, and more flavorful, and more nutritious food. And it takes um, young people to be captains of those industries and to enter those industries and allow um, them to innovate and be creative in them.
Mm. Uh, we are talking about ICT and the youth, and we can't run away from the issues of social media. This is where they are seeing some of these um, unhealthy lifestyles. Uh, how are you, I'll come back to you, Mianna, how are you trying maybe to get into that whole social media vibe? Because at the end of the day, that's where three, the three quarters of the youth are spending most of their, especially urban youth, are spending most of their time at, and that's what's inf influencing their decisions. Are you using social media to, you know, maybe, you know, uh, uh, market some of these innovations that you're having with regards living healthy, healthier and living healthier lifestyles? Oh, definitely. Um, so the thing with uh, most food production, you know, uh, we're used to agriculture. We're used to, you know, digging in the dirt, yes. being burnt oh, by the sun. I want to say agriculture, <laughs> people can really turn over, especially <laughs> us. Yeah. Especially I'm these. guilty as well. I'm guilty of that, you know. Mm -hmm. But um, with our technology uh, with, and what we're doing at, at Vitagro, um, we use hydroponic technology, which is a lot cleaner way to farm, a lot more um, uh, efficient way as well. And most importantly, it's a, it's a model that fits into urban environments, mm -hmm. which means you don't have to drive miles all the way to Bikita to try and... Uh, you grow your tomatoes and whatnot. You can have your greenhouse in your backyard. Mm -hmm. You can grow your produce and sell your produce right there. So, you know, we're trying to present that on social media as well. We're trying to present that aspect of farming, of producing healthy food in a way that is more appealing to us, you know, us, us bougie children who don't like <laughs> digging in the dirt. You know, and I feel like in that way, if you now encourage people to also grow their own food in that way, if you're growing your own healthy food, you're more likely to eat your own healthy food. Mm. So what are you, uh, maybe if you can share what you're currently doing to help uh, youth uh, uh, in boosting healthy foods, what are you doing on the ground? Especially, you know, even if we go back to Nyadze, social media, ICT, what are you doing? What's on the ground? Okay, what's on the ground right now is, um, well, I have a background of culinary arts. I'm oh, a chef. Wow. So whatever I see, whether it's vegetables and all that, um, I want to present it to somebody in an appealing way. And I feel that my face will be in that plate as well. So what I'm currently doing is, um, uh, like what Samantha was mentioning about things being accessible, there's a lot of wastage that is happening. And as Zimbabweans, we're used to eating very fresh things. And you just eat half of it, and then you throw it away. But then still in Zimbabwe, people are suffering, and there's a lot of deficiencies. There's a lot of wastages that is happening. So I'm into agro-processing as well. So I process things, we pickle stuff, we make juices from interesting things like tamarind even, which you actually drink. I'm even using the rind of the watermelon itself because I think that's where 50%, that's where you lose about 50% of it. And then there are health benefits in there. Mm -hmm. And looking at where we are going to, there's a lot of SD, uh, SDGs that, that are being spoken about as in wastages and getting to feed people. So if you do that, you then see that instead of just having that watermelon and eating a quarter of it, you're going to use some of it in the future to do something and it has different nutrients in there as well. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking at a fruit or at a vegetable and trying to maximize and um, uh, the nutritional value and also the lifespan of it. Mm -hmm. So that's what you're doing at Zorum wow. Goti. And then when you're using it fresh, then it's delicious and mm. has less of those things that are not good for you. So vegan diets, uh, things that are good for people's deficiencies. And I've also opened um, uh, this thing where if a person is on a program, and they want to, they can allow us to work with their dietitian or somebody where we can prepare their foods for the week. Because mm -hmm. you know you have busy schedules sometimes, not having the skill. Everybody can cook, mm -hmm. but you can cook like everybody was baking during uh, COVID. But mm -hmm. is there now everything is going back to normal? You're going to be baking consistently, mm -hmm. so that's where we come in, and then we give you food where you're informed about what you're eating and then keeps you in shape and you're happy and we are happy at the wow. end of the day. So and what's the, what has been the response from the youth with that? That sounds really exciting. Uh, it's what's been, been wonderful response, and great yeah. because when people buy your products or buy my products, they, they, they feel safe. You know when mm -hmm. you want to buy something and you're comfortable, you know somebody is taking care of that yes. thing already. It's like it's tailor-made for you. Mm -hmm. So I'm told I have problems with maybe getting the right dress or something. Mm -hmm. If I go to a tailor and then puts it like that, I understand the person. So there's a one-on-one -on -one, uh, exchange that happens to me. So when I make something for you, you know you're vegan, you don't have to worry about mm -hmm. things. You know you don't eat pork, you know you're not going to even think that, okay, I saw a little pink bit, what is that? Mm -hmm. So that is what I'm trying to offer to them. And then uh, 
keep it as clean as possible. Mm. I think I'm going to go back to, I think, the one yeah. thing that Charlene spoke about in terms of the economy. And sometimes when you hear vegan, yeah. it sounds so expensive. <laughs> <laughs> what are some of the vegan choices that are inexpensive, Charlene? Do you think that maybe the youth should try uh, that won't, you know, pinch on their, uh, on their pocket? Okay, so I am an ultimate advocate for traditional or localized indigenous foods. Mm -hmm. So there is a wide variety that hasn't even been tapped into, mm -hmm. you know, and that is like the best base to start from because it's affordable, it's best suited to the climate of Zimbabwe, and literally that's where the youth could start. So it then comes back to the recipes and the packaging and everything because, you know, you have, for example, you have your millets, You've got sorghum, you know, those are looking at the grains. We've got a variety of tree nuts indigenous to Zimbabwe, you know, not looking at your important nuts like the almonds. You know, we've got local ingredients that are just as good mm -hmm. or even healthier than what we import. And those are really expensive. And that's what people base their vegan meals on. Mm -hmm. The important thing, imported um, ingredients, because that's what you find on in the internet, mm -hmm. you know, those are set recipes. But so I'm an advocate for the indigenous foods, and there are a few companies in Zimbabwe mm -hmm. who are actually producing finished products wow. that are vegan friendly with these localized um, ingredients. Yeah. Oh, okay, <laughs> traditional foods is yeah. going back to the roots. Going I like that. I, I would want to. Impl I would definitely want to start implementing <laughs> yeah, and then absolutely. looking into yeah. into uh, getting more of my traditional yeah, foods. Samantha, sure. you're an activist, and we've spoken again on issues of attitude, mm -hmm. just changing the attitude and shifting uh, the minds of the youth to say, you know what, you need to take care of your health. You need to e eat healthy. There are some issues as well that you know that uh, what can I say that. Uh, maybe have a significance in the influence uh, in, in the choices that uh, young people are making in regards to their healthy diets. You're talking about issues to do with drug abuse mm -hmm. and yesterday it was uh, National Youth uh, Day and their theme, the theme was to alleviate uh, issues to do with drug and uh, you know alcohol substance abuse and substance yeah. abuse and some of these drugs that are on the streets no matter where you are you mm -hmm. can be on this side of the yeah. town or this side of the town it's there and the youths are consuming this and they suppress the uh, what uh, the um, uh, appetites for for the youth so what are some of the in your view what are some of the things that can be done in line especially with looking at making sure that you are healthy and you have a healthy diet what can be done to maybe shift those attitudes within the youths mm. so we really need um, we need role models and also we need to involve people. You know, I've seen the mistake that we do, you plan for somebody. I think also as a young person, I would understand that's why there's so much resistance. So it's not really nice. Mm -hmm. So we must have an, a process that involves everybody. Yes. Uh, in our sector, uh, we, are, we now have a mantra that says nothing without us, nothing mm -hmm. without persons with disabilities. Mm -hmm. When you look at the, the kind of innovation that has been there, I was thinking of the app, Yekuti, you order and they bring the food to you. That's considering the accessibility issue of persons with disabilities. So imagine if you don't have uh, that involvement of people with disabilities, you wouldn't be as innovative. Mm -hmm. These apps that are coming up, they know that people can't be you know, mobile a lot then they have to order their food and, and you bring it to them. That's actually a great business. Mm -hmm. That has also been seen from um, including persons with disabilities who are not mobile. Mm -hmm. So these are things that I think if we involve everybody, if we involve, our food labs were very inclusive. Um, I, I, I also noted the choice of the cities, Bulawayo and Harare. Mm -hmm. We've got different uh, food choices. We, we are different people. Ubuntu Betri is different. Mm -hmm. And I, I really like that, that it can be easy to, to actually, you know, um, take to other cities. So I think that the involvement of everybody is very, very key. And if you just plan for people, resistance is going to be higher. Mm -hmm. The issue of role models as well. Uh, maybe if you can 
uh, maybe expand on that in terms of yeah. role models? How do and they I think then that's them? actually the essence of the food labs, yeah. where you've got the champions yes. for good food. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of people that we look uh, up to people. Mm -hmm. um, I remember being featured in this book, uh, the, the Founding 100. Mm -hmm. It's for young women below 40 who are doing great things, uh, you know, in Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. And when people read that book, when people see us and we interact with them, they really look up to us to say, ah, what really makes her like this, yes, you know? Exactly. <laughs> and if they get to know that, ah, she's eating healthy. Mm -hmm. For me, I've got a lot of work to do. Mm -hmm. I want to uh, be thankful because they didn't say, uh, we want to choose people who have already been in it. Mm -hmm. You know, they are people who had already been uh, conscious of their food and everything, but also that process of changing mm -hmm. to make um, the, the food choices that are good for me. This is one thing that I've, I've, I've really taken out of this. So the food champions mm -hmm. are really a, a great thing that we can uh, adapt and make people role models and say they can, people can emulate what they're doing. Mm. All right, now Munyarati, we come back to you with issues to do maybe with what's in the lab, lab, lab. Uh, what is the potential contribution of localized food production to young people's health? Mm. So um, as I mentioned before, uh, a lot of the barrier that comes to producing food, especially uh, produce, uh, for young people is the accessibility of it. You know, you have to drive all the way out to a farm. And that's, a, that's even if you have the farm in the first place, which a lot of young people don't have. So having localized food production actually increases the access of young people to be now the ones in charge of producing the foods. Mm -hmm. And if us young people are producing the foods, then we know how to market it. We know how what products would appeal to our fellow young people, like you were saying. Mm -hmm. The marketing is very important, and the presentation is very important. And another thing with um, produce in particular is uh, when it's grown uh, a long way away from when it's produced, right? You're going to lose a lot of your nutritional value, a lot of your flavor, in that process of transporting it back to the center of consumption. You know, we spoke about how uh, there's a basically a trend of, um, of unhealthy habits uh, over the years. But you, if you also look at it, there's also a trend of you know, people moving away from the centers of production, away from the farms where food is produced. So now if you bring the farms back into the city, you know, now you can start to produce foods that aren't just for shelf life, but also for nutrition, you know, like tomatoes. Mm -hmm. um, used to be nice and juicy and sweet, but they wouldn't last long in yeah. the market. So, you know, uh, farmers would now start to produce tomatoes instead that lasted long but didn't taste as good. Mm -hmm. Now, if the food is localized, you know, you know, as a farmer, if I grow this today, pick it today, it's going to be eaten today. Mm -hmm. So I can focus on healthy food. I can focus on more nutritious, more flavorful produce that way. Mm. Now, unfortunately, our time is running out. But Zoro, I will want to come to you. You're the chef in the building. Give us maybe one tip. Uh, of a healthy, easy, you know, something that is accessible to everyone that you know is definitely in someone's kitchen that they can use and turn it into a very healthy, you know, good meal. Good meal. Mm -hmm. Ah, Charlie. <laughs> <laughs> She's also a chef, so I'm sure we could. Oh, yeah. She is. But so we could chef. actually. So please, maybe. At a, a tip. Yeah. Yeah. Charlie, what could we do with cabbage? Because it's accessible to a yes. lot of people. <laughs> and I feel it's something that we could actually make in three ways or four. You know, you can actually take your cabbage and you can actually pickle it. And then you can put it in there. And then it's good for probiotics. People are making such things. Mm -hmm. You could actually take the cabbage. You can make fritters with it. Just mm -hmm. take it, grate it a bit. You put in a little bit of spices, you put a bit, maybe a handful of flour, maybe an egg, and then you make a patty, you fry it, and then you can use it on a burger bun. Wow. Or you can put it something and then you can get to enjoy it. <laughs> what else can we do, Charlie? Okay. <laughs> so you know I'm very biased yeah. to traditional food. Uh, <laughs> so I would totally encourage people to use the pulses and legumes, right? And because of the time of year we're in, mm -hmm. we're going towards, you know, harvesting season. So I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about the nimos, the nyembas, you know and your ground nuts. Mm -hmm. So you could easily make a hummus. Oh, my other thing is when I use traditional foods, it's strictly for modern <laughs> recipes. Yeah. So don't ask me to make sadza. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so, <laughs> yeah, so for me, it's, it's, you know, so you can literally make a nyemba, which is cow peas and nyemo bean hummus. Right, and usually you make hummus What's with chickpea. It's it's a chickpea uh, dip. A dip. 
Oh, yeah, yes. so you use chickpeas and some spices. It tastes awesome with some crackers or some vegetables. I just cut up vegetables. So literally, you could use your localized available ingredients. And it's filling. And it's mm. filling as well. Mm. Yeah, so imagine it's, it's healthy, um, easy, accessible, affordable. So you get to eat fancy, mm -hmm. delicious, but, but you know, local. according to your pockets. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. So well, thank you very much for coming to to studio to share this with us. We will be having more shows. I think next week, same time, same place. We will be having more conversations on nutrition and the youth choices with regards to nutrition. So thank you very much, Lean, Samantha, Munyarazi, and Yuzoro, for coming through to studio to share with us all these things. Now we will be having, as I said, another discussion, same time next week, same place. This is a special broadcast that was brought to you by Hevos and UNICEF in partnership with ZTN. I am Samantha Rizare. Pleasant viewing.